I want to talk about something that happened to me a few years ago. You will have to imagine how many. When I was a grad student, uh, and I was at the other Cambridge, about which I need to say a little more in a minute, Cambridge University. I was 20-something, uh, trying to do a PhD in the history of science, and very earnest about it, I was. Uh, and uh, one day, uh, to my department, unknown to me at the time, came an invitation, which wasn't directed to an individual, it was an invitation to the department to send someone to a small uh, adult education group outside Cambridge, someone who could give an entire semester worth of instruction on Charles Darwin. Uh, the uh, invitation came from a village, uh, which I still remember, called Willingham. I have to tell you, uh, the other Cambridge has some things in common with this one. It has a river going through it, which is about a tenth as wide as the Charles. You know, everything in England is smaller than, than it is here. And that's true of, uh, of the Cam. That's why it's called Cambridge, right? Um, and uh, the other thing, though, that makes it very different to this Cambridge is that the other Cambridge is dominated by a single university, and outside of Cambridge, to a first approximation, there's sort of nothing. I mean, this is a fairly isolated part of England. Uh, in fact, the story goes that the people who founded the University of Cambridge were dons, uh, as they liked to call themselves, from uh, what in England is usually called the other place. They don't like to refer to, refer to each other by name, but it is actually Oxford which was already up and running in the 13th century, but where for some of the dons, it was all getting a little too hectic and a little too distracting. I mean, these were people who took their um, monastic isolation very seriously, so seriously that some of them decided to up sticks, leave the uh, flesh pots of Oxford and find the, most find the most remote place in England they could in which to pursue their studies, and they chose Cambridge for good reason. It's in an area of England called the Fens, which used to be swamps before, and they would have been swamps, actually, most of them at the time that these people set up the university. Um, they were drained with the help of Dutch engineers in the 18th century, uh, but they're just flat agricultural land with a very low population density, and that's all there is around Cambridge. And the invitation to my department for someone to go and teach a course came from a village in the middle of the Fens, and guess what? Nobody in my department was keen to go. So this invitation bounced slowly down the department from senior staff to junior faculty, from junior faculty to uh, really quite experienced graduate students. It ended up with me because I was the most junior person in the department. And I kind of, I kind of thought, well, this sounds interesting. I was doing work to do with evolution. So why not go out to this place I'd never heard of and see what it was like to teach whoever was there? I had no idea, really. So it turned out to be a Wednesday evening, and on the Wednesday evening that I was first due to go out, some kind folks had offered to give me dinner before I taught my first class. So I got dressed up, you know, in, uh, back in the times I'm speaking about, the st students just wore denim, uh, nothing else, so I didn't think that was appropriate. So I put on more or less what you see now. You might wonder why I'm wearing this slightly. I had a jacket like this. Might even have been this one. I was trying to decide before I... <laughs> whether this is the actual jacket, but to be honest, I think the laws of entropy prevent this being true. I think that it was, I think that jacket went, uh, went away a long time ago. But anyway, it was one like this. And so I got dressed in what I thought would be appropriate attire. I got on a bus, which took about 45 minutes to meander out through the fens, and then these kind folks gave me dinner. And by the way, it, I had been asked to talk about Darwin, but you know, I'd never done anything like this before. I decided that you had to start you know, at the beginning. So I thought I'd better talk about the ancients and about Copernicus. Uh, so I was also working in a department that had a small museum, so I borrowed, I can't believe they let me do this, I borrowed an orrery, which for those of you who don't know is a kind of model of the solar system showing the, 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 the relative positions of the sun, uh, the planets, the moons, and so on. And I thought this would be a helpful way of introducing the Copernican Revolution. I had enough material, you realize, in this class to last about three years. <laughs> and uh, so I ended up, finally after dinner, clutching my orrery, being walked over to the village hall. 
in Willingham. And in the village hall, there were a surprisingly large number of people, 30 or 40 people, much older than me, uh, and they looked very different. And I had no idea where they came from. They looked like they'd lived in this village all their lives. And I was supposed to talk to them about Darwin. By the way, this group belonged to a fantastic Victorian organization called the Workers' Educational Association. Now, this is a thing that goes back to the Victorian period when so many people in Britain didn't have a chance of an education, and you know, this august body gave them one. And this group, bless them, had decided to do three years uh, for a particular course of study. They were going to do three great 19th century giants, Darwin, Marx, and Freud. Those were the days. That's serious stuff. So I was number one. And to say that I was inexperienced is an understatement. So I uh, got into this village hall. I set up my orrery. I was introduced very fulsomely. They were very polite. They're very English. By the way, I'm English. I'm sorry. Uh, that, that, <laughs> that, the English do apologize a lot. That is, so uh, not least for the fact that they're English, we just had Patriot's Day. But the. <laughs> We are sorry, really. Um, but, but anyway, so they, the audience was very polite, and this matters for what happened next, because I started my presentation with my enormous quantity of material, started manipulating my orrery, and I had the benefit of a, of a conventional blackboard and chalk. So before long, I started writing on the blackboard, and then I did something which it turned out, later I discovered, I always do, if you give me a piece of chalk. I dropped it, and it broke. So I bent down to pick it up, and the seam <laughs> in the crotch of my trousers split. And it split audibly, and I could feel it. And I just sort of froze, and I had no idea whether you, as it were, had heard it. I had no idea how I looked, but you, you, I, I suspected the worst. But you couldn't really look to check. I mean, you know, what would you do? And so I, and, and I couldn't really ask to leave the room, and anyway, I hadn't brought a spare set of clothes, so I had this sense that I, I probably um, didn't look quite the way I would want below the waist, but I wasn't sure. So I had this double-breasted, as they call them, jacket. So I thought the thing to do, I better button this up. So I, so I did this and sort of pulled it down. And I thought, I've just got to carry on. I mean, what can you do? So the audience sat there and they continued to listen and I continued my speech, but now I felt at a disadvantage uh, even more than I had before because I daren't turn around. I had no idea what I would look like from behind, <laughs> but I was supposed to be writing on the board, right? So for the rest of the evening, <laughs> like this. And I just as hoped they would think that's always, you know, how he, that's how he does it. He's left-handed, I mean, what can you expect? You know, so somehow, somehow, I got through the road. This was a two-hour session. I think I was only about 10 minutes in when my trousers split. So I got through the rest of the evening, and I don't really remember too much about the remainder of it, but I remember vividly what I'm telling you now. And I finished my talk, and I thought, I've got to get on the bus and get home. And then, um, at the end of my talk, a guy came up out of the audience, and he came up and he shook my hand and he said in an accent I can't really imitate. The Fenland Tigers, as they call them, have a particular way of talking. Uh, and he said, I'm so grateful to you for what you said tonight. So I think I probably said, really? <laughs> and he turned out to be an agricultural uh, laborer. He'd worked all his life in this village on the land. And he said, I've never before, I've often wondered why the moon changes shape in the night sky. And you've explained it to me. I understand. So in my manipulation of this orrery, of course, I, I don't even remember doing it. I must have explained how the relationship between the sun 
and the moon and the earth gives rise to the appearance of the moon from a thin crescent to a full moon. He'd been working under, he was a perfectly smart guy, but he'd been working under the wrong assumption. All his life, he thought the moon was a source of light. So if it's a source of light, why does it change shape? And he'd never understood. And he just looked at me with this expression that said, this is fantastic. To understand this after all these years looking at that moon. So I got back on the bus, by which time, by the way, I checked my trousers in private, and I had a six to eight inch gap. <laughs> I mean, they had really gone. <laughs> and I sat there with my jacket still buttoned up and my orrery, and I kind of thought two things. I thought, well, I got away with it. And by the way, we were all English, so of course I don't know to this day whether they ever knew. <laughs> because if they did know that I had split my trousers, they were English, they were never going to let it be known. They were never going to comment. And I never raised it again. I did buy a different pair of trousers. But the second thing I thought was, well, you don't have to get it all right, but you can do something here. And that experience kind of changed my life. And that's why I ended up doing the kinds of things that I do now, including the stuff I do here. Thank you. As Chris said up top, I am moving to the UK in the fall, and I am looking forward to a nation of people living in the middle of a bog who constantly apologize <laughs> for everything they do. And so you can split your pants and have no one comment right. on it. That's right. Yeah, it's that's right. It's very no good. Unlike here. Um, so